Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and we're ready to dive right into the Gulf Cooperation Council. I would like to begin by introducing our chairperson. As I mentioned earlier, there was a change in schedule, so our chair for this panel is Professor Farid al uh, Since we arrived in Singapore, Professor al has been a very supportive uh, friend to the Middle East Institute. He is the head of the Department of Malay Studies and is a sociologist by training. He also comes from a rich tradition of academia, and he and his father and their family have made their mark in not just Singapore, but in Southeast Asia. So if I could please hand it over to Sayyid al and he will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rana. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to uh, have been asked to chair this session. Um, uh, panel 7B, Wither, the Gulf Cooperation <coughs> Council. Um, I'm not going to take uh, um, m much time. Um, let me just uh, tell you what we're going to do. Um, we will proceed um, according to the order of the uh, program, um, beginning with uh, Dr. Christian um, Koch, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Dr. John Anthony. Um, you're not Dr. Martin. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> OK. Yes. We can always, one can always hope. Um, and then uh, last but not least, Dr. Malik uh, Dahlan. Um, each speaker will have 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I think we can, if we, if we all agree, uh, we'll wait for all the speakers to make their presentations and then proceed with their question and answer session. Yeah, that's OK with uh, everyone? Um, OK. And um, so without uh, much ado, if I, I, you know, I may have some uh, comments, which I, I, I will reserve for uh, later if um, you know, there is a need and if um, um, the rest of you run out of things to, uh, to say, which I'm sure you, you won't. Um, so with that, um, I would, um, and I'm not going to also, to, in the interest of saving time, I'm not going to uh, really introduce the speakers by reading their bio data because everyone has it, right? Yes. So uh, it's my pleasure, therefore, to um, uh, invite Dr. Christian Koch to make his presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me first of all, of course, add also my thank you to the Middle East Institute and the National University of Singapore with the invitation to come here. Um, I think it's uh, a great idea that one has an institute now in the region that provides sort of a, a look from Asia, also because of the uh, you know, ever emerging relationship between Asia and the Middle East, and I congratulate them on, on, on this move. Um, what I'll be talking about uh, briefly in the 15 minutes is sort of looking at the changing international relations positions of the GCC states. And this is very much a, a work in progress uh, as I also developed this into a larger book project uh, to really look at the evolving position um, of the GCC states when it comes to their foreign policy and the international relations uh, position, <coughs> I think. It is based on uh, what one has seen lately is a, is a great amount of activism uh, uh, within the GCC uh, about putting forward certain stances. Um, and I want to sort of analyze whether this is really a, a different era that we're looking at now, uh, what the reasons are behind uh, some of the activism that we've seen, uh, and then maybe provide just some food for thought for the, uh, what are some of the implications. Uh, uh, again, it is very much a, a work in progress. So if not everything makes complete sense or, or links into one another, I apologize for that, but uh, I'll be looking forward to your comments and criticisms on that as well. Um, well, let me start first of all by simply saying, you know, what are sort of the, the, the actions that we have seen uh, uh, in the past sort of decade, or uh, I would actually say since about 2003, uh, where we really see the Arab Gulf states taking on a more pronounced uh, diplomatic role. Uh, trying to uh, mediate, uh, bring about conflict management, uh, certainly not waiting anymore for regional or international events to be forced on them, but trying to enunciate a position, uh, get a little bit ahead out of the game. Uh, so I would argue that sort of 
You know, there is, is an active period of Gulf diplomacy that one hasn't seen or really previously heard of. Um, and there are numerous instances where we can see this happening. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, when you're talking about the Gulf region itself, uh, we see the development of the GCC, we see uh, a greater degrees of regional cooperation taking place, certainly some tangible prog progress on uh, economic integration, uh, customs union, uh, common market, some free trade agreements being signed, including one with uh, Singapore, uh, the implementation of a GCC power grid or plans for a railroad network. Um, there are also a lot more frequent consultations on, on political matters. And I think this has led to a number of better coordinated approaches among the, the states. Uh, we saw that Bahrain and Qatar resolved their territorial disputes through the International Court of Justice. Saudi Arabia and Qatar have come closer together and have resolved some of their differences, which were perennial in the 90s. Um, even in the current economic crisis, we see that uh, Abu Dhabi will not necessarily let Dubai completely fail. Uh, they will step in uh, when it becomes, you know, an issue of, of, of the Federation itself, the UAE. Um, and I think, you know, we have a lot more different mechanisms uh, in play at the moment, where there's, there's a great degree of interaction among uh, the, the senior officials. Uh, uh, if you look at the GCC, there are now regular meetings of the Ministers of Justice, the Minister of Interior, the Ministry of Education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that certainly has, has led to a lot more closer familiarity with one another and enunciations of the various positions. Um, so that's really on the regional front within the GCC. Um, I think we've seen better coordinated approaches on regional issues. We just recently saw the attempt to, to pro provide a, a solution to the situation in Yemen, uh, which has brought all the GCC states together. We certainly see an evolving common position on uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, uh, while although there's always been this instance that there are some diverging views that Oman might be able to, uh, might take a little bit of a different position towards uh, the Iranians than the Saudis will, I still think that overall what we have seen is a sort of convergence where there, uh, there's generally an agreement of, of, of what uh, the situation in Iran means for the region and how uh, the region should uh, respond. Um, and then we see if we go beyond that, we see a lot more activism on, on the Middle Eastern front. Uh, uh, certainly Saudi Arabia with the uh, uh, Abdullah Peace Initiative, which is now the Middle East Peace Initiative through the Arab League. We see attempts to bring together Iraqi factions, Palestinian factions, uh, uh, involve oneself in situations in Afghanistan. We see Qatar playing a much more pronounced role, most recently, of course, uh, in the case of, of Libya, where it was the, the, the Qatar, uh, initiative eventually that gave legitimization to the old NATO-led uh, intervention in, in, in Libya, uh, the Qatar involvement to produce the 2008 Doha Accords on Lebanon. Um, so all these again are issues where the Gulf has been, the GCC states have been quite uh, active. Um, and we even see sort of, you know, broader visions of what a future Gulf security system uh, would look like. And here, uh, I specifically refer to uh, uh, Saudi Faisal's, the Saudi Foreign Minister's speech at the 2004 Manama Dialogue, which I think still is one of the best enunciation of what uh, a future uh, Gulf security uh, framework would look like with a unified GCC, as he said, a unified GCC, a prosperous Yemen, a stable Iraq, and a friendly Iran. And then also internationally, I think one can make an argument that the GCC states have come out more into the forefront. There certainly is an effort to sort of diversify set of relations uh, with the uh, <coughs> European Union countries, uh, with Asian countries. We see credible amounts of uh, exchange of heads of states visits. I think basically almost all of the GCC leaders have in the past five years at one point or another made the trip into Asia to various countries. Uh, we see uh, an, an outreach even going on to countries of Latin America, Africa, uh, looking into various issues there, food security being one specific area of interest when it comes to, to Africa. Um, the UAE has certainly been in the forefront of this, has trying to establish more international coalitions, which it sees for its own benefit. Uh, it was Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, the UAE foreign minister, who went on a trip to 14 Latin, 14 Latin American countries uh, in order to get uh, the approval of the various uh, members of the international community to get the seat of the International Center for Renewable Energies to be in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and in the end, uh, here, uh, the UAE was successful. 
uh, and beat out Germany at the end, which nobody really gave them a, a chance uh, at some point. Uh, you see more pronounced positions, for example, the EU uh, with the GCC states and the EU, where the uh, GCC states have decided to back out of free trade area negotiations uh, with the EU back in December 2008, saying that they've had enough of the EU intransigence and, and therefore they were not going to continue those negotiations. Uh, um, and that's, I think, is, is sort of an evidence of the GCC position. Um, and then we shouldn't forget the more wider international framework in terms of uh, global financial crisis and the involvement of, of, of key uh, Arab Gulf states here and trying to look at uh, the role of Saudi Arabia within the G20 framework or, or even the role of Gulf states in, in climate change negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. So I think on all these fronts, we do see a great amount of activism. Now, what are some of the factors? Why? Why do we suddenly see this activism? Um, well, I think there are a number of them, and, and there's not really one single explanation that will go forward to explain this. Um, I think uh, certainly globalization. I think globalization sort of in this combination with geography. Globalization has sort of leveled the playing field a little bit. It has opened the doors uh, for uh, at least some of the, specifically some of the smaller GCC states uh, to project their interests uh, a little bit more out more. There certainly is this determination within the region to take advantage of uh, new commercial opportunities that, are pro that globalization offers to try to benefit a little bit more from growth in the developing world. Um, and on this context, I think you can criticize Dubai a lot, but I think Dubai did the right thing by taking advantage of the situation back in 2002, 2005, of really projecting itself out there and making a name for itself, uh, because the advantages it gains from that uh, are, are quite tremendous. And uh, despite the problems now with real estate uh, sector having been decimated by the financial crisis, the infrastructure that's been built up in Dubai uh, is not going to go away. And that's really going to benefit the region and Dubai specifically uh, in, in the near term. Therefore, globalization has, has allowed the, the GCC states to sort of put themselves a little bit more on the map. Uh, I think the combination of energy and economics is important. Energy, of course, because that's the, uh, the basis for everything uh, in the Gulf uh, and why the, the, the Gulf is so important <coughs> generally. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it's no longer just about being hydrocarbon exporters. It's also about being an investment uh, destination in the end of effect. Uh, the financial windfalls that the uh, GCC states have been able to gather together because of the high oil price environment uh, in 2010, we see a, a budget surplus of 55 billion combined at the GCC level. Uh, and that's been a, a yearly, yearly thing. It's not been just a one-off uh, kind of budget surplus, but we've seen this uh, over the last several years. I think that has certainly given them a, a level of foreign policy independence. They can use this kind of money to project their influence. Uh, but it's only also attracted others to come to the region in, in light of the tremendous amount of infrastructure development that's going on and the commitment by the governments to promote that kind of in, uh, in investment in their own infrastructure and their own development. So there are a lot of opportunities here for, for foreign companies also to come in uh, and gain a share of that windfall. Um, we then have, I think, generally confidence and maturity uh, among the GCC states. I think there's a sense among the ruling families that you know, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, we have survived uh, uh, four very tumultuous decades, uh, basically since our independence, uh, looking here at the 1960s, 1970s, when Kuwait became independent and then uh, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain uh, followed. Uh, you know, survived the end of colonialism, uh, the discovery of oil and all the tremendous social changes that that has brought about, uh, the crisis of uh, Iranian revolution, Iran-Iraq war, invasion of Kuwait, yet we're still here. Uh, that means some, we must be doing something right in the end of the day. And I think that has sort of contributed a little bit to a confidence that we can also go beyond. Um, another factor I think is uh, specifically a certain disillusionment with policies of the United States and, and the West in general. And I think here the Iraq invasion certainly serves as a catalyst uh, because that sort of highlighted the divergence of views between the two sides. Uh, I think Juan Quo mentioned already in the last uh, session a little bit this notion when Sarah Faisal spoke in, in New York at the Council of Foreign Relations in 2005 about how the, how the Iraq war had simply delivered uh, uh, the Iranians, uh, the Iraq towards Iran and how disappointed they were uh, with uh, U.S. policy in the region. Uh, I think this kind of uh, uh, 
uh, question marks about U.S. policy continues even now in terms of what is the position of the Obama administration on the Arab Spring. Uh, was it right to simply drop in uh, what is considered in Saudi Arabia a traditional ally like Mubarak and drop him like a hot potato? Uh, uh, so there's question marks about this and again the need to uh, put forward an independent position. Uh, but it's not just the United States. I think it's also the West sometimes in general. I think the global financial crisis is certainly in the Gulf is seen as being uh, uh, the failure of the West and the global economic order. Uh, uh, and therefore, it's not something that was caused by the Gulf states. Um, and two other quick factors. I think uh, the power vacuum in the, in the Middle East certainly contributed also sort of by pushing the Gulf states in the forefront. They had to take position, not necessarily because they want to do, but you have an Iraq that was in shambles with the occupation. You have an Egypt that continued to be largely isolated or static with the Mubarak regime. Syria still being very suspicious because of its alliance with Iran. So on all these things, the GCC states are sort of forced to, to, to step in. Um, and then I think there is this slow also final factor, the internationalization of the Gulf. Uh, Europe is paying more attention to the region. Uh, Asia is paying more attention to the region, and this again opens doors for the Gulf states to sort of project what some of their interests might be. Um, okay, now briefly just to conclude, then there are, f so where we go from here? What does this really mean? Um, is this now, this activism that we see, is this a move towards a more coherent GCC policy? Uh, is this a new era we're talking about? Uh, what does it mean for relations with traditional powers like the, U the U.S.? Uh, and what might the current environment sort of uh, impact on that? Uh, well, I'm very skeptical that this is, I mean, again, this is sort of just preliminary thinking on it. Um, I think largely it's not necessarily a new era. Uh, I don't see a coherent GCC policy from coming about. Uh, I think the GCC as, a, as a, an organization basically remains a shell organization. I think it's still basically national decisions. Uh, it's itself, it's not interstate, it's uh, not suprastate, it's certainly still interstate. Uh, uh, I still think there's some lingering distrust among member states. Most recently we saw the UAE Oman's uh, spy ring and the scandal over that. Uh, I think in large amounts it's still seen as a zero-sum game uh, for the GCC states when conducting their foreign policy. Um, I think globalization has sort of provided a space for some of the smaller countries to sort of carve out a role for themselves, to step out of the shadow of the, of, of the Saudi Arabia. And I think you see this mostly in the cases of the UAE and Qatar. Uh, UAE certainly uh, uh, continuing with their policy of economics first and nothing on politics. Uh, we want to carve out economic commercial relations uh, with the rest of the world. Um, I think Qatar simply because they don't trust anybody. Uh, so they will just go and, and, and try to get everybody on the table. Uh, but again, this gives them an opportunity to step out of the Saudi Arabian uh, shadow. Um, I still think there are a lot of limitations in terms of the GCC or the, or the structures, the bureaucratic structures in place. Uh, still top-down personalized decision making. Uh, you're still dealing with small states that have no critical, uh, uh, credible military power. Uh, uh, the sticks are limited, but and, and the carrots that the GCC states can offer can only go so far. Uh, and again, on, even on GCC integration, I think we are talking about a mixed track record. Uh, the economic integration has proceeded, but we just had the announcement that the customs union will actually not be implemented now till 2015. Uh, we still don't have any monetary union, with the UAE and Oman having opted out. Uh, certainly don't have any common foreign and security policy. Uh, you know, in the, in the Bahrain intervention, we talk a lot about uh, Peninsula Shield. I'm not really sure what Peninsula Shield is anymore. Uh, the, I thought it was disbanded a while ago. And, and, uh, does it still exist? I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, um, so I think it's very premature to talk about a GCC uh, foreign policy. With regard to the U.S., yes, certainly there is this cost-benefit analysis going on in the region. Uh, uh, but, you know, we saw last night in the speech of President Obama sort of in, uh, a little bit of a shift almost. That the U.S. is going to position itself more with some of the people power in the region. Uh, and then what does that mean? The, UA, uh, the U.S. no longer has the status quo power. Uh, uh, now, that's not going to be a shift that's going to be sudden or tomorrow. Uh, mm. uh, but again, uh, you know, are the GCs, because here the U.S. is still central. 
in terms of the defense of the, of, of the GCC states. They're certainly not going to cut their traditional ties to the U.S. Uh, and, and, and move on to sort of untested either regional s uh, security arrangements or rely on other powers like Europe or Asia, which I don't think, simply think have the capabilities or the willingness to get involved in assuring uh, uh, Gulf security. Uh, so, you know, okay, there is an attempt at diversification, but basic parameters of closeness to the U.S. simply re remain in, in, in place. Um, and then finally, as far as uh, the implications of, of the political changes in the region, uh, well, certainly some of that is going to have an impact also on foreign policy. If you see different governments coming into place now in the Middle East, they're going to take different foreign policy positions, and we already see that as has been discussed in this conference in the case of, 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 of Egypt. Uh, so we may be entering an environment where uh, in the past the GCC states have been forced outward to take positions, but now with somebody like Egypt coming back onto the overall uh, diplomatic game, that Egypt regains that position and that the GCC states will one again, once again uh, take a step back, which is their preferred method, I think, in their role, and let others sort of get out in the forefront, not necessarily uh, uh, them. Um, and even if, if we have a change in the region itself, uh, or if the political climate uh, gets more antagonized, the focus is going to be much more inward, uh, and not necessarily so much on, on, on outward and, and, and how you deal with that. Uh, so um, I do think that we are looking at more or less maybe just a passing phase rather than really a shift uh, overall in what, uh, as far as the uh, GCC is concerned. And then I look forward to your questions and hopefully criticisms as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we, at the Middle East Institute, um, in the past there had been some discussions on um, comparisons and um, between various models uh, and uh, the extent to which uh, experiences in Asia, like ASEAN or APEC, um, are relevant to um, the Middle East. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to discuss that. Perhaps there might be some issues pertaining to that uh, that will be raised in the discussion. Um, I uh, now would like to invite Dr. John Duke Anthony from Georgetown University. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've all been asked to keep our remarks to 15 minutes. And so as we're talking about a six-state uh, region, versus some of the previous speakers focusing on one country, Iraq, or one country, Iran. Uh, this will mean something like uh, two and a quarter uh, seconds uh, per uh, minute, excuse me, uh, per country and the GCC as an organization. Inevitably, this will lead to a degree of superficiality, but if something's worth doing, um, it's worth doing superficially, so here we go. Uh, with regard to the uh, concepts, uh, I don't uh, disagree with anything that my colleague uh, Christian mentioned. If you discern a, a, a divergence here, please uh, come at us in the Q&A there. Uh, but I would come at it a bit differently, descriptively and analytically, in terms of what is the GCC all about and what is it not? Uh, because there's a, a, f a fair amount of misinformation or mysteriotyping um, in, this, uh, in this regard. In terms of the categories of its interest, because the focus has been on changing interest and what are the implications, but not all interests have changed, many of them, more of them are constant uh, than have changed, I would rank them in the following six categories, almost in this descending order of priority. The overarching one is a set of strategic interests, and the shorthand for this would be uh, the goals of achieving and maintaining, preserving, protecting, expanding uh, security and stability. Uh, and related to that is the attainment at uh, some indeterminate port in the future en route to uh, that particular destination of peace and prosperity. So those would be the four short words there, and the latter two cannot be obtained analytically or procedurally without the first two uh, being, being obtained. Uh, if you had to uh, define this a little bit more precisely, you could take uh, what is the essence of most countries' uh, preambles to their state constitutions, their national constitutions, which are namely to protect and advance uh, the, their citizenry's domestic safety, protect and advance the citizenry's external defense, protect and advance the citizenry's uh, material well-being or their standard of living or being able to adjust to the uh, cost of living, and fourthly, an effective civil system of uh, 
of justice in terms of law enforcement. If you wanted to have a more universal frame of reference for this, you couldn't do better than the United Nations Charter in terms of every a new member to the United Nations must be able to demonstrate that it has its national sovereignty, its political independence, its territorial integrity. As a frame uh, or a hypothetical, uh, not uh, parenthetical expression of the malaise towards uh, something that the United States brought about in the region in the last eight years, it is that it took all four of those first aspects of domestic safety, external defense, material well-being, and civil system of justice off the table in the case of Iraq. All four of those were smashed to smithereens. And with regard to the three of the United Nations Charter in terms of national sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity, they took the first two of those off the table as well, and the third one uh, is, is in a nominal uh, context. Uh, going down the scale here, uh, the second set would be a uh, category of economic interest. The third would be a category of political interest. However, primarily external political interests, foreign policies, foreign positions, foreign attitudes, foreign actions, not the domestic. Uh, this will mean something like uh, two and a quarter uh, seconds uh, per uh, minute, excuse me, uh, per country and the GCC as an organization. Inevitably, this will lead to a degree of superficiality, but if something's worth doing, um, it's worth doing superficially, so here we go. Uh, with regard to the uh, concepts, uh, I don't uh, disagree with anything that my colleague uh, Christian mentioned. If you discern a, a, a divergence here, please uh, come at us in the Q&A there. Uh, but I would come at it a bit differently, descriptively and analytically, in terms of what is the GCC all about and what is it not, uh, because there's a, a, f a fair amount of misinformation or misstereotyping um, in, this, uh, in this regard. In terms of the categories of its interest, because the focus has been on changing interest and what are the implications, but not all interests have changed, many of them, more of them are constant uh, than have changed, I would rank them in the following six categories, almost in this descending order of priority. The overarching one is a set of strategic interests, and the shorthand for this would be uh, the goals of achieving and maintaining, preserving, protecting, expanding uh, security and stability. Uh, and related to that is the attainment at uh, some indeterminate port in the future en route to uh, that particular destination of peace and prosperity. So those would be the four short words there. And the latter two cannot be obtained analytically or procedurally without the first two uh, being, being obtained. Uh, if you had to uh, define this a little bit more precisely, you could take uh, what is the essence of most countries' uh, preambles to their state constitutions, their national constitutions, which are namely to protect and advance uh, the, their citizenry's domestic safety, protect and advance the citizenry's external defense, protect and advance the citizenry's uh, material well-being or their standard of living or being able to adjust to the uh, cost of living, and fourthly, an effective civil system of uh, of justice in terms of law enforcement. If you wanted to have a more universal frame of reference for this, you couldn't do better than the United Nations Charter in terms of every a new member to the United Nations must be able to demonstrate that it has its national sovereignty, its political independence, its territorial integrity. As a frame uh, or a hypothetical, uh, not uh, parenthetical expression of the malaise towards uh, something that the United States brought about in the region in the last eight years, it is that it took all four of those first aspects of domestic safety, external defense, material well-being, and civil system of justice off the table in the case of Iraq. All four of those were smashed to smithereens. And with regard to the three of the United Nations Charter in terms of national sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity, they took the first two of those off the table as well, and the third one uh, is, is in a nominal uh, context. Uh, going down the scale here, uh, the second set would be a uh, category of economic interest. The third would be a category of political interest. However, primarily external political interest, foreign policies, foreign positions, foreign attitudes, foreign actions, not the domestic uh, uh, political interference or intrusion in one another's affairs or other countries' intrusions into their affairs. Uh, thirdly, uh, fourthly, 
uh, would be a set of commercial interests. These have now, for the last quarter of a century, been separated out from the economic interests. The economic interests externally uh, certainly include the exports of their finite depletable resources of oil and gas to international uh, markets and the funds therefrom, the revenues therefrom, uh, funding uh, the government's uh, existence and operations. Uh, with regard to this, we'll come back uh, greater in detail in the Q&A perhaps, because this one has italics around it, neon lights around it, it's in capital letters, this non-interference in domestic affairs of other countries there. It was first hammered out on the anvil of the Algiers Accord of March the 6th, 1976, between Iraq and Iran, and the other GCC countries yet to become GCC countries were present in the form of, uh, of representatives. It was hammered out again in UN Resolution 598 of July the 15th, 1987, to bring about the ceasefire in the Iran-Iraq War, especially Article 6, which uh, called for the establishment of a tribunal to assess compensation damages as to who really started this particular war. There is a pan-GCC belief and consensus that had uh, Iran not violated the Algiers Accord 111 different times, all of these instances reported to the UN Security Council Secretariat in Iraq not violating it once. There are no Iranian uh, cases of, of Iraqi violations of it in the UN Security uh, uh, Council's Secretariat, rather, uh, that there wouldn't have been the Iran-Iraq uh, war. And this was furthered when Kuwait was liberated uh, in terms of the March 6, 1991 gathering in Damascus and of all GCC six foreign ministers plus those of Egypt and um, Syria, in which this was the first principle of the four that were enunciated there. So nothing is more uh, bedrock center in terms of a strategic political policy and mindset and orientation amongst the six than that. The fourth category uh, would be a set of commercial interest. These are separated from the economic ones. These have to do with trade, investment, technology, cooperation, the uh, establishment of joint commercial ventures, uh, the uh, currency uh, stability in terms of continued maintenance of the pegging of the international financial transactions to the American dollar. The fifth category, which has been creeping up in the last decade, has been in the realm of defense cooperation. There are four defense cooperation uh, agreements between the six uh, GCC countries in the United States. There's an older one, 10 years older, of an access to facilities agreement between Oman and the United States there is no such comparable agreement with Saudi Arabia and the United States. However, uh, here one must be careful not to confuse form with substance in the sense that the reality of the U.S. defense and security cooperation with Saudi Arabia is both longer, more massive, pervasive, and extensive than that between the United States and any of the other five GCC countries, or arguably all of the other five GCC countries combined. Notice that I haven't said anything about soft power in terms of a sixth category of U.S. interests uh, on which more rhetoric and ink has been spilled uh, than any of the five uh, before that. Here we're talking about promotion of civil society organizations, human rights, uh, 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 civil rights, uh, uh, gender rights, uh, popular participation in the national development process, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press, etc. These have been more rhetorically indulged, but under the microscope more politically expendable than any of the other five beyond that. And even in the case of the president's speech last night, so far we'll, we'll have to see whether it's more than kalam fadi or empty rhetoric, etc. Name the occasion where the United States has mobilized and deployed massive numbers of forces to pursue that particular six uh, interest there. So this is something in which there's a consensus between the GCC countries and the outside powers in, in that particular regard. If I can just focus briefly on the economic aspects, as uh, uh, Christian uh, implied or indicated, the record has been mixed. Uh, however, the common external tariff, which was a long time in coming, uh, has indeed been consensually uh, agreed to. The holdouts for the longest time were Saudi Arabia with the higher tariffs and the UAE, i.e. Dubai in particular, uh, on the low or almost non-existent uh, tariffs. Uh, each country's position was valid in terms of traditional economic uh, uh, theory. We can explain that in the discussion. With regard to late 2008, 
In the last months of the George W. Bush administration, the Deputy Secretary of Treasury sent an emissary to four of the six GCC countries, almost with begging bowl in hand, sort of, hey, fella, can you spare a dime? The reaction to most of the GCC members of fi uh, ministers of finance at that time was, why is it that you're always coming uh, uh, to us uh, uh, asking for assistance uh, for when you're on a crash landing? This time around, we demand to be with you on the takeoff. And so a breakthrough in that regard is that there is now not just the G7, G5, G8, but also the G20 with Saudi Arabia and that looking out or representing the interest of the, of the, of the other five. And then you have the creation of the sovereign wealth funds, which uh, sometimes can be misleading if you look at it uh, uh, literally there. More particularly, they are government investment institutions. There are some uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds. The Abu Dhabi Investment Authority would be one of them, but Mubadala would, would not be. That's a government investment uh, institution. Uh, so these underscore the uh, prominence of an aspect of the GCC region as a whole that no one would have imagined when the GCC itself was established in 1981. So f they've gone from where they were m most uh, forgotten and forlorn corners of Arabia, the last and the least, uh, to be de developed, to be at the top of the list in terms of material well-being, in terms of their economic prowess, in terms of their economic appeal, in terms of their economic positions and roles in regional and world affairs as well as in their own societies there. Back in terms of the political aspects, the record has been more extensive and impressive than I think much uh, that would pass for conventional wisdom or established thought or informed opinion would recognize. For example, in terms of the Iran-Iraq war, they were key with the five great powers on the UN Security Council in that resolution of 598 of July the 15th, 1998. That was the first one since the Korean War where you had had 15 out of 15, or rather a unanimous vote on a war and peace particular issue. The GCC countries were essential in terms of working with the, uh, the 10 that were not the uh, five uh, permanent members there. Also in terms of cooperating uh, with the foreign fleets that came under Operation Earnest Will that effectively uh, uh, succeeded in getting Iran to accept that resolution, although it took 13 months for Iran to do it, whereas Iraq had accepted it in 24 hours there. 55,000 uh, foreign soldiers uh, frequented each of the GCC countries uh, during that particular three-year period at the end of the Iran-Iraq war. And then fast forward to the Kuwait crisis of 1991, there are 550,000 uh, foreign soldiers were uh, accommodated in the GCC countries. And that led to the UN Charter uh, principles certainly being enforced uh, uh, on a rare occasion in terms of Kuwait's national sovereignty, political independence, territorial integrity and safety, the Kuwaiti people being restored by that, but only in a cooperative arrangement with the six GCC countries, which used their influence in the League of Arab States to pass two path-breaking resolutions, one on August the 3rd, the day after the resolution, 12 to 9 with the votes, the six GCC countries plus six others that they persuaded to stand with them uh, to condemn what Iraq had done to Kuwait. And then one week later, August the 10th, 1990, the same breakdown of the vote, 12 to 9, calling for all Arab armies to mobilize and deploy to Saudi Arabia to prevent the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait from extending. Those two acts broke the strategic geopolitical uh, arrows in Saddam Hussein's uh, quiver, who up until that point had said, look, uh, the Westerners are not coming because they're in love with your dark eyes, etc. The, the, the Crusaders are coming again, and try to uh, have a unanimity of resistance to that. So the GCC countries were, were essential in that. Also in terms of the Taif Accord of 1988 between Kuwait and Algeria and Saudi Arabia in revising, re-engineering the Lebanese political structure there, which actually increased the role, the position, the influence, and the power, and the preeminence of the Shia aspects in Lebanon, uh, a, a particular story in that that I think has largely been lost. And in 1989, at the summit in Muscat, uh, this was the year of the implosion of the Soviet <coughs> Union and the winds of the democracy sort of breaking out in Prague uh, uh, and uh, Romania and Bulgaria and Poland and, uh, and uh, Hungary. Uh, there, Kabus was the first of the GCC heads of state to say that from this point on, we have to think in terms of uh, geopolitical and strategic and economic uh, concepts in the following ways, a horizontal way and a vertical way. The horizontal way is to 
uh, realize that we cannot defend ourselves or deter effectively Iran or Iraq, heaven for, forbid the two, um, uh, whatever is within our means uh, uh, to accomplish. We have to recognize that we have plenty of company in the world of the 212 countries in the world, 210, uh, 200 countries on the same boat as we are. Therefore, uh, we have to associate ourselves with the great powers whose interests are identical to ours, similar to ours, or complementary to ours to achieve that particular objective. On the vertical aspect there, this is our responsibility between uh, governors and governors, governed rulers and rules, sovereigns and subjects here. This is our responsibility to narrow the gap uh, between the governmental structures and systems of status quo and political dynamics in the citizenry as a whole. If we do not do everything necessary and within our power to narrow that gap, we have no one to blame but ourselves in terms of outsiders fishing in troubled uh, waters, uh, which would directly impact our security and stability uh, strategic objectives in addition to our objectives in the realm of peace and prosperity there. With regard to uh, after the liberation of Kuwait, I've already mentioned the Damascus Declaration of 1991, which was an effort to provide a new structure for what would be acceptable relations within the Arab body politic that had come crashing down since Camp David when, uh, of 79 when Saddam Hussein in, invaded uh, Kuwait. And though uh, Damascus is not s still involved in that, the principles of it again, of non-interference uh, in domestic affairs is still on the table. With regard to 1994, from April to July, in terms of the Yemen civil war, all six of the GCC countries actually supported South Yemen in the secessionist movement, without exception. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, uh, uh, the, it's been completely reversed in the sense of the GCC's positions have been supportive of uh, Yemen retaining its national sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity. At the donors' conferences, at the Friends of, of Yemen's uh, conferences in London and in Jeddah and elsewhere, the, uh, the billions uh, that the GCC countries have pledged towards Yemen uh, uh, dwarf any from any of the other 140 developing countries in the world. Admittedly, they haven't been administered, they haven't been expended, but this is largely because of the lack of effective inst institutions on the ground or competent institutions on the ground in Yemen or the assurances that the funds would not be misused or mismanaged uh, 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 go, go other than for the, uh, the intended purposes of the, of the donor there. Saudi Arabia alone has provided Yemen with $1 billion for each of the last uh, 20 years. Uh, this is from Prince Saud's statement a year and a half ago in, in Jeddah. And also, the, in the last year, the six G, uh, five G, four GCC countries, of uh, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, have pledged $10 billion for the next 10 years, $1 billion a year for Bahrain and Oman. Per capita, it's substantially more for Bahrain uh, than it is for Oman there. Uh, Christian has alluded to the activism and the proactivism of the GCC countries, but it's primarily been three. It's been Qatar, it's been the United Arab Emirates in Oman. Qatar in terms of Lebanon, Yemen, Sudan, Libya, uh, where it, half of Qatar's air force uh, is uh, in Crete, assisting with the no-fly zone in Libya. And also its efforts in the Israeli-Palestinian arena, trying to broker an agreement between Hamas and, and, and Fatah. The United Arab Emirates in Afghanistan, more than 500 um, uh, Af uh, UAE troops are in Afghanistan, unbeknownst to most people assisting in the, the NATO operation there, as well as the UAE's uh, activism in terms of Iraq and earlier regarding uh, Somalia. Saudi Arabia with regard to Somalia, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and its role there with Pakistan in helping to bring about the end of the Cold, uh, Cold War. And as was alluded by one of the speakers this morning, uh, which I overlooked myself, Saudi Arabia's involvement in backing uh, Egypt strategically and in a military strategic context uh, through the annual, not the annual, but the regular Bright Star military act exercises between the United States and Egypt. These are the largest anywhere in the world. And that Saudi Arabia and all the other GCC countries have been observers on each of those for the last uh, two and a half uh, uh, decades. And that is part and parcel of Saudi Arabia and others smarting from the way in which the, the United States seemed to so cavalierly or too quickly or uh, dishonorably uh, turn its back on Husni uh, Mubarak. And the last analysis here, if you apply the exit entrance uh, test uh, to the GCC countries in terms of their security, stability, their prospects for peace and prosperity, 
you would find that the numbers of people who have immigrated from the GCC country since its establishment 30 years ago uh, this week, because they thought that the country was going to hell in a handbasket, that there was no future, uh, that there were better alternatives, the number for the six is tinier than minuscule. And that itself is, is, a, is a documented uh, statistic with all of its strategic and geopolitical implications. The aspect of the other side with regard to the entrance test amongst all Arab countries or parts of the Arab world that people line up at foreign embassies to try to get a visa to relocate to, to live and work in because of the opportunities there. Again, it would be the six GCC countries, not the other 16 uh, Arab countries in the League of, of Arab States. And finally, with regard to whether it is to be poo-pooed or laughed at, uh, the prism can be the European Economic Union, which was uh, founded uh, with uh, more auspicious uh, support in terms of having NATO at its back. The GCC has nothing comparable to that. Also having the Marshall Plan, the Bretton Woods Plan um, at, at its back. The GCC has not had anything like that. And the psychological ruin of, of the European Union founders of between 50 and 60 million uh, people having uh, been killed during World War II. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I must apologize. I'm, I'm a miserable failure in getting people to stick to the time. Um, <laughs> Eight to 17 minutes. <laughs> right. um, but you see, you must understand that this, you know, that lady over there is breathing down my neck from so far away, but she succeeded to do so. So, you know, um, let's try to stick uh, to the time. But, you know, we do have a lot of time for discussion, so whatever um, is not being said during the presentation can be brought up during the Q&A. Um, so I would like to uh, invite um, uh, Dr. Martin Witt from the University of Southern Denmark. Yes, hello, and uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. For me, it's a great pleasure not only to be amongst such distinguished colleagues, but also to be in Singapore, a place I've never been before. Well, I'll change the focus quite a bit from sort of outside looking at the, the Gulf Corporation Council to an inside view uh, from each of the six countries. What I'm going to do is uh, to look at the current visions, the current development plans, to see actually what aims, especially in an economic sense, uh, they have. So if we look at the GCC countries overall, we will you know, judge from the statements, we will see the actual investments and uh, so on, that they have a widespread and persistent wish to diversify their economies, to, re to create economies which is more market-oriented, and create economies that certainly offers employment possibilities uh, for a much larger part of the population. The question is, for me, in this pretty unorthodox paper, uh, how are they going to do it? And to that extent, I tried to assemble all the current uh, development plans, to read through them, and to analyze exactly how these countries are going to uh, fulfill these overall aims. And this is what I'm going to speak about today. I'm going to say s just something about planning, uh, something about the context of the plans which are on the table right now, and then I use most of the time on findings and then some conclusions. And then, as you can see in the bottom part of it, where it's work in progress. I hope you will give me input. Just very shortly, planning defined as a de deliberate governmental attempt to coordinate economic decision making over the long run, blah, blah, blah. And um, the reason why, you know, if we look into the textbooks and uh, into the planning ministries all over the world, uh, why are we doing economic planning? Due to market failure, uh, due to lack of private entrepreneurs, something about facilitating uh, or mobilizing resources, some attitudinal impact, and so on. Uh, we'll not talk more about that at the moment. But the context, uh, the current plans written by the GCC countries, each of the countries, they are written during basically within the last uh, three, four, five years. And they are all pretty optimistic about life 
simply because they're written uh, before 2008. But the environment in which they have been written is uh, I've divided into three different parts. But in the policy dimension, we would say these plans are written with, under the doctrine of the neoliberal uh, thinking, the Washington Consensus, which basically states that market-led development is good, state-led development is bad. And also, uh, as uh, Kristen was talking about, the globalization. Uh, in order to reap the benefits of globalization, you need to do three things. Privatization, deregulation, decentralization, as one. You need to open your economies, the second one, and you need to apply good governance. So I'm going to ask these development plans, uh, how are you actually implementing uh, policies like that? The second uh, main thing uh, which is nesting these uh, development plans is this uh, change between allocation or production state or probably, as uh, Stephen Herzog was saying yesterday, by taxation and non-taxation states. We know the division allocation states, uh, that is the rentier states, uh, they get all the money from oil, and uh, they don't need to tax the population, and as a result, there's very little focus on production. While in a production state, the state income and thus political and economic power within such states, they stem from taxation, the ability to tax. So in this way, there's a very, very distinct focus on uh, creating an efficient production system. So are the GCC countries changing from uh, allocation state thinking to a production-oriented uh, thinking? And the third uh, sort of environmental uh, dimension of these plans are the economic dimension. Uh, it is a situation of optimism, of a lot of money uh, being around high oil incomes, and even after the 2008 crisis, uh, as you all know, uh, oil prices are booming around uh, $110 at the moment. So that's a very optimistic thing. And then I just added this small point down there, the impact of the Arab Spring is unclear, uh, simply because we don't know how it is going to impact uh, development and uh, so on. But it's definitely not written into the development plans. So in this analysis, I'm basically looking for uh, which type of state is envisioned in the future, allocation, production state. I've been moving towards a production state. Who will be the driver of the economy, state versus market, or public versus private sector? Strange division in these four ones. And uh, what kind of uh, comparative advantages are created? And then the disclaimer. In this uh, setup, I do not argue that neoliberalism is the best policy. I do not think that uh, all good things go together. Um, and especially in, in the bottom, I recognize that planning and actual implementation of policies potentially could be very, very different. So I'm not extrapolating from the plans into uh, reality. So what does the plan say? And I have one slide for each country. Uh, thereby doing my two minutes of each country. Uh, Bahrain, economic planning is a very, very recent phenomenon. I talked to uh, the head of planning down there. He said, well, it's done within the last five years, done by external uh, agents. And uh, they do have the vision 2030, which express a strong drive to diversify, to let the private sector become the driver of the economy. Job creation is the key aim. Bahraini workers are not currently the preferred choice of labor. They state that bluntly. Uh, they want to shift from low skills to high skills jobs. And they want to introduce uh, meritocracy. That's a difficult one. Meritocracy uh, in the long run. So Vision 2030 is a frontal attack uh, against the rentier thinking. It does have a neoclassical uh, economist flavor to it. And uh, the meat 
journalists will say it's a bold list of the strategic, strategic plans published in the region at the moment. Kuwait, uh, they have a current long-term plan, plan, the Vision 2035, uh, which is just recently basically published. Uh, they worked on it in 2009, it was published in, in 2010. And um, that is a nesting uh, a number of five-year plans, which wow. I've been doing for quite a number of years. Uh, the current plan is the first one actually since 1986. Uh, it's an investment plan, a lot of investment. Private sector seems to be the ones uh, spending half of it. Uh, and half of it is public, and there's a lot of crisis packaging. <coughs> and the vision, the aim is to, they all say, Kuwait to tr make it a financial and trade center, attractive to investors, with the private sector leads the economy. Well, and the Blair plan, uh, Tony Blair Associates was invited to write a plan, and they made a 430-some pages uh, development plan for Kuwait. Uh, which says all the right things, and but it's unclear to us and uh, whether... Uh, I, I actually spoke uh, just a, a month ago with the head of planning in, in Kuwait, and he said, well, planning, uh, this plan is our official policy, but no one knows. Uh, so the Blair plan should be implemented in one another way. They have a bad planning story. Uh, lack of consensus, la the current situation where they don't have a parliament is a good testimony to that. Uh, they do emphasize private sector, and uh, they do emphasize a very, very state-led environment. I have to speed up just a bit. Oman, they have been planning for 76, as I'm saying here. They have a current vision 2020. They are very keen on economic diversification. They actually put numbers on it. Oil should go down from nine, to 9% of GDP from 45. That's easily made because their oil resources are running out. Uh, they are emphasizing tourism and gas industries. They are doing a lot of specific reforms. So despite of the positive uh, sort of uh, or their emphasis on privatization, they are um, it's still a very state-led uh, way of uh, creating development. Uh, they do have some genuine attempts to roll back the state, and uh, they do aim to change into a neoliberal setting. Qatar, well, also plan one of the positive ones from 2008. Uh, it's a very, very uh, sort of... Uh, rounded, uh, I would say superficial, short and superficial uh, plan. Point is that uh, sound economic management, res responsible exploitation for oil and gas, planning in a situation of plenty, and they want a slow diversification process. So they're planning for future with oil and gas and not without it. Do have some neoliberal uh, thinking in it, uh, however not aim of the private sector to drive the economy. It is still very much state built. Saudi Arabia, I have to hurry up just a bit. Uh, I would say they have been planning for a long time. They want to raise the national economy and uh, probably their major uh, issue is to um, create jobs. Uh, it's not private sector. Uh, it's it's a uh, what one uh, small and medium sized uh, industries, uh, probably state made. And United Arab Emirates, they also did launch a plan. Um, it's followed the government strategy uh, of the UAE, and the point is very general in terms and it seems to sort of build the bridges between the, um, uh, the seven emirates. They also want to diversify from oil, foster industrial high growth and uh, create a knowledge economy. Very limited role of the private sector. Uh, they believe in market economy, but the public is the owner. So one could call this diversification without privatization. 
And then we get to the conclusions, and I'm good on time. Uh, first, the things they share. They all aim to diversify their economies away from dependence on oil and gas. For oil, Oman and Bahrain, because they have limited resources, it's a very urgent matter. Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, little urgency. They, they simply seems to be a little urgency. Uh, Qatar, as I was saying, plan for slow divers diversification process. And Saudi Arabia is a mixed thing. They, they do have the large oil resources, but uh, their economy is unsustainable, and especially uh, levels of no unemployment uh, currently, so they need to diversify. All wants to do the feel-good things, uh, improve education and healthcare and so on. They all want to create comparative advantages to put more and money into productive assets. Differences among the plans. Uh, should the private sector be the driver of the economy? Very different. Bahrain and Oman say yes, it should be. Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar uh, simply uh, signals a continuation of the state-led development model. And UAE explicitly have no aims of increasing the private sector. Uh, the private sector is not mentioned, I think, more than once or twice in the entire plan. So the overall conclusion would be that the state remains the driver of the economy and the private sector operates in niches in the market where the state does not operate. And as such, it's not a, uh, possible to identify a distinct turn to a neoliberal uh, private sector-oriented policy. It can be argued that the current level of plan signals a shift towards a more production-oriented development model, however. Uh, the countries are investing money in real productive assets in order to secure future income uh, and employ their rapidly increasing workforce. Uh, and despite or except for Bahrain and Oman, it is a state-driven development. Uh, so, it does not imply private sector enlargement, but production is going to take uh, on or continue to take on in the publicly owned firms, what I would like to call the state initiated uh, firms. So, are the Gulf states aiming to, uh, to move toward a production oriented development model? You could say a careful yes from this study. They're moving there simply because they're investing in their own countries because, you know, there's a weakness of this uh, analysis, actually. Uh, if a Gulf country invests outside their own country, we would still call it renter, renterism. But if they invest inside, it will be a, in a production-oriented uh, way. And in, uh, as such, the current emphasis on um, crisis management and uh, building local resources all aims at um, creating more production. So this is my uh, final slide. And uh, it's basically here to, uh, for discussion. We could say that we have different, three different uh, types of development uh, from the plans. Uh, we have Bahrain uh, and Dubai. Uh, which are liberal, market-oriented economies. We have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, and UAE, even though Oman tried to say something else, uh, which exemplify a continuation of rentierism. Private sector does play a, uh, is aimed to play a very little role. And then uh, Kuwait, at the moment, is still, to some extent, war-torn. They are experimenting with democracy, which doesn't work that well. And uh, the current political fights in Parliament uh, have put them in an economic storm and, uh, stormate. So um, I'll end there, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, we now turn to our last speaker, Dr. Malik Dahlan, Institution Quraysh. Okay, I will. Malik. How's everyone doing? 
Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I, I was uh, asked by a friend of mine uh, to go for a, a lunch to enjoy a fi fish head curry. And I told you, I told him wither the fish head curry as I need to come back and get everyone engaged uh, after the last, uh, uh, last speaker in the session. Um, I consider myself um, a uh, part of the MEI family and I do think that they have done a, uh, an amazing job just comparing uh, to what was going on here six, seven months ago. Um, I also want to uh, thank everyone here in Singapore for uh, giving us the opportunity coming from Arabia and enjoying this wonderful metropolis um, which is a shining symbol of the vitality and economic advancement that now defines uh, so much of East Asia. Um, obviously in the decades since imperialism receded in this region, countries that were once hostages to uh, to, to, to the will of foreign occupiers, as well as the struggle for self-determination, have now taken control of their own destinies and chartered the new path towards development. Um, I applaud the incredible progress uh, that is transforming East Asian, the community of nations, uh, as well as Singapore. I think that as much as we're witnessing the biblical changes in, in the Middle East, um, um, it, it really is quite phenomenal to see what is happening in Singapore and this, I think, uh, newspaper would show you that evolution probably, if not revolution, uh, will ultimately lead to, um, to, a, uh, to the just uh, causes that we seek. I'm also grateful for my uh, cousin and brother here, uh, uh, Dr. Sayed, my great-grandfather, a hundred years ago, after the world, uh, first world war, uh, left uh, Mecca to uh, to to be mufti here in Singapore. Uh, we never saw him since then, and we stayed behind. But it, again, it talks about this engagement with Asia, and the roots that we share with this wonderful uh, place. Uh, and we all enjoyed the conversation yesterday to hear the roots of Arabian uh, uh, points. My, talks are, my talk is really motivated by bigger ideas about political economy and I'm sh uh, 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 the political economy of the rule of law transitions and uh, not democracy. Um, and, uh, uh, and my friend David Madnikoff mentioned to you the, the fact that we end up sort of working together and I always joke and say um, I approach things, I'm not an academic because academics are too academic and professionals are not uh, professional. So uh, uh, to that end, uh, I want you to think of that graph that David had put forth about finding an opening. Uh, henceforth, it should be known as the Madinkoff uh, chart and, and uh, the rule of law, the effect of the rule of law. And instead of political, I would urge uh, David to consider political economy or political economic openings. Uh, <laughs> to that end, I will also <laughs> Um, I, I cannot distance myself from what has uh, been happening in the region and certainly the time I had spent here in Singapore uh, where I had the opportunity to discuss precisely the, the, the point that uh, 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 my cousin the Sayed here was talking about uh, in terms of the relationship with Asia and influence of Asian cooperation. The, the problem we have in the region is that it's a region that is not regionalized uh, and we still suffer from the idea of the nation state. Um, and as John also mentioned, there are six different states, they're trying to find a way to work with each other, but they're certainly nowhere close to a United States of America or a UAE or even an e EU or even knowing how the regionalism works together. Um, having said that, I want to recognize uh, Professor Tommy Ko, who is the looming tower of, uh, of efforts here in Asia and Singapore, the, 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 the brain father of the ASEAN uh, 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 community as well as APEC um, and it's, been a, it's a pleasure for you to be here sir and uh, for you to, to reflect on the points that we discussed. I left this um, uh, intentionally for the group because this is the, uh, the quote that uh, uh, Michael mentioned yesterday um, and the point of it is that uh, we have as a, as a region, as a nation, even our self-description has been the subject of uh, Western uh, interest. 
Um, and to that end, everything and uh, every approach that we come to seems to be hostage to that uh, description. Um, um, and um, as for the Arab uh, or the uh, Arab uh, Spring or the, uh, I, I, I'm vehemently against that uh, uh, term. However, I should say that uh, the story begins 100 years ago uh, when we started the struggle for self-determination uh, through the Arab revolt that started uh, by uh, Sharif Hussein bin Ali uh, of Mecca, who you, I'm sure, know very well and the story is known for all of you. Uh, and since that first bullet that was shot at Al Ghazza Sharifian Palace in Mecca, uh, 100 years later, almost exactly, we are uh, we were uh, faced by a young uh, Muhammad Bouazizi, Allah Rahman, who uh, decided to set himself on fire. Again, frustrated and uh, manifesting this idea of self-determination. Um, um, I think that um, also it's important to understand um, that the revolution that we've been facing lately is not necessarily a, 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 a political one. It does focus on the idea of a generational revolution. It's not defined by one group or one people. Uh, and perhaps this is an important point for us to consider where Middle Eastern studies have gone wrong in trying to understand what's going on. A uh, perfect example for this, uh, my friend, Sultan al-Qasmi, who has just left from the UAE, who's now become a, uh, oh, here he is, who's now become a, a figure for, um, you know, social media and sharing all the ideology that a younger generation is sort of the millennial generation, we should call it, even though it's on the cusp of the Y generation, has been trying to sort of explain. And again, it's a driver for this civilizational cause as opposed to any ideological uh, 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 um, uh, restraint. Um, and I will say that we are living through a very uh, critical constitutional moment. Uh, think of it from a rule of law perspective, a rule of law moment that is not harnessed because the opening came before the rule of law here, um, which rose above and beyond the long-standing sort of ideological competition between Islamism and Arab nationalism. Uh, think of it as a vision in Leo of ideology, which is not too dissimilar to the uh, pragmatically articulated uh, uh, approach that one of the founding fathers of this country has come about uh, 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 making self-determination in, in, in Singapore, uh, Dr. Gokin Sui. Um, who is a personal hero of mine. Uh, I will go very quickly uh, to the specific presentation, but um, let me just say that um, it is, um, sorry, iPads and modern technology. I'm sure Sultan will tell us more about that later. <laughs> um, Again, if we think of the unilateral approaches that have been taking place in the region, as well as the multilateral efforts and the regional cooperation, if you think of those as the three levels of governance, and governance, again, an extension of law and policy uh, being intertwined, um, the region never really harnessed the tools and the, and the, and the utility of, of, of such um, outputs. Um, the GCC itself, uh, faces its political challenges, and I'm sure we all heard everything that was discussed, whether it's the social unrest or uh, whether it's the advantage or the course, uh, curse of, the, uh, of oil. It remains lagging behind. And the problems with the rentarianism and, and, uh, and the inability to diversify the economy is also part of that. So what about it? What about the... The, the, the Arab Spring or the political transformation. Uh, outside, um, <laughs> um, this is the problematic itself and the drawbacks that we end up facing in the region. And I want to go through the failed experiences with regionalism very quickly. And again, you can consult the paper for it. Almost 70 years of attempts. Um, sorry. 
70 years of attempts, and you can go down the list to see everything that has been taking place. Um, none of them have uh, been successful. Recently, um, um, we had the Arab League summit at CERT with the colonel himself and uh, uh, abandoned by uh, Secretary General Amr Musa now for, for the presidency. And in August, Turkey came back to find its strategic depth in the region, uh, fetching for a further elaboration of that. Um, again, they signify this bigger problem, which is the failure of Arab regionalism in coordination and collaboration. Let me talk about regionalism post Jasmine Revolution. Um, we do the, you've heard a little bit about the GCC expansion, which um, was proposed on May 10, 2011. And this is an internal Arab agenda led by the Saudi government. And I think that one shouldn't mistake what's going on in the region. There has been some serious tension between the kingdom and the United States. And Saudi Arabia decided to sort of go forth with their. It's with the common defense or the approach with the GCC monarchies with Jordan and Morocco. And, um, and uh, the consideration for some sort of an EU approach expansion. But then again, think about the downturn um, uh, and, and what, what the causes of, uh, uh, of failures of some of the economic countries and the, um, the, of the, the countries in Europe um, after the downturn, financial downturn. Now, what's really interesting is yesterday's announcement of uh, pre President Obama's uh, tippy, as though we need a tippier region, um, which is in his fourth point about uh, a comprehensive trade and investment partnership initiative in the Middle East and North Africa, an evolution of MEPI, but something different. Um, we've been working, we work closely with a firm in Washington called Covington and Burling, and that firm it has the legacy of Dean Atchison, uh, uh, the former U.S. Secretary of State uh, in the United States during the uh, World War II, and precisely the man who designed the Lease Land and the Marshall Plan and NATO and the U new UN. Uh, and we've been working closely with the State Department and with others uh, to promote such ideas that can work together. Um, these are the specific points that uh, President Obama announced, which to me were very interesting, only because the model we proposed and discussed was really focusing on the Asia-Pacific economic cooperation and not, um, and not, uh, 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 and not EU. But I suspect the reason why they went for the EU model was because it was going to be announced uh, through uh, the G8 meeting next week, and because the French were push pushing for the Euro-Mediterranean uh, relations. But it will be interesting to see how that will ultimately unfold. Rethinking the role of the GCC, I would like you to particularly focus on the last point here. Um, if you consider the leadership role and the effort that the Saudi government and the GCC is sort of taking forth, uh, what does it mean to, to have an expansionist uh, uh, outlook um, what, for defense, for trade, for investment, regulating existing agreements? Even think of Wadi Araba and uh, Jordan's peace treaty with uh, Israel. Um, the oil trade balance and the diversification of the economy, uh, the common market, the common currency, and so on and relations with Israel. Um, again, recently, what we have seen, um, the GCC has shown an inclination to lead uh, through the involvement with Bahrain and Yemen. And there has been active involvement, and that was discussed already by my colleagues. Um, and there is a discussion that the GCC would take a more powerful regional uh, uh, role. However, without a commitment to the rules-based approach uh, it will be very difficult to move forward uh, in that. Mm -hmm. Very quickly on Tipi, I will leave to you the, the quote that uh, President Obama has used. And the gist of it is that there are proven experiments as to how regional integration can work. And if you look at it, it's about aid. Uh, you know, it's about focus on trade, not just aid, on investment, not just assistance. The goal must be a model in which protectionism gives way to openness, 
uh, the, re the, the reins of commerce pass from the few to the many, and the economy generates job for the young. America's support for democracy will therefore be based on ensuring financial stability, promoting reform, and integrating competitive markets with each other and the global economy. My colleague discussed those, some of those regional, the, some of the theories behind the Washington Consensus, and I won't go through it, but I want you to think about transgovernmentalism and specifically neo-functionalism as it had operated during the post-World War II era. Um, this is, these are concepts that are not clear uh, uh, in, 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 in Arab statecraft today. Um, negotiation theory and the idea of incrementalism is also a problem. APEC and what it represents, a lot of people accuse it of being a photo op, but it's more than that. Um, again, the APEC model is a, very, is a soft law approach uh, which promotes investment liberalization, business facilitation, economic and technical cooperation. <coughs> Think of it from that perspective. 21 member countries have a card to get around uh, without visas to all the countries. We still have problems in the region about that. So on the new regional alternative, um, we need to think about whether or not uh, the region can benefit from an APEC model, uh, whether a new diplomatic conference, again, meeting and meeting and deciding whether a new var uh, variable geometry, different approaches to dealing with each other can move different parts, gradualism and different configurations, as well as defining the goals as economic, non-economic and institutional. I would also say these are the attributes and pros of APEC, and I encourage you to look at it from the soft law perspective. Again, you look at the ASEAN exper experience and the different, the idea of variable geometry, how they all interact together. Compare that with what's happening in the Middle East. You look at the OIC is ineffective, the Arab League is ineffective, the GCC is reactive. The WTO is supposed to be the holy grail, but as John mentioned yesterday, 42 laws in Saudi Arabia, none are being apl applied. Next year will be the trade policy review for Saudi Arabia with 360 reservations on its accession proposal, no one's saying anything, and we have these problems. Um, again, it, it is a very technical and long um, Exper uh, 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 exercise an article, and I encourage you to read it because I do want you to tell me what you think and because I pe spend a lot of time. But let me give you a very interesting point here. If you look at the fifth, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth point, look at the ASEAN principle. This is an Arab principle that has been adopted in ASEAN and APEC, the idea of mushawara and muafaqat, the idea of consultation and finding consensus. This is, a, this is a principle that is applied now in Asia, which was, in a way, an Islamic Arab export, which we don't seem to be able to capture even in our, in our own understanding of a wider context. There are criticisms, and I'm not gonna say that there aren't. I put the EU model here just to tell you that I don't think it will work, but again, Let's see what the G8 will come out with. I also pose these bigger questions about um, the Gulf region and engaging in this, uh, whether or not the Gulf should engage with this initiative that's coming from the US, or would it end up being a separate exercise that's purely internal and Gulf oriented, or will it work with TIPI more uh, closely? Um, we do have to mention as well the interdependence between the Asia Pacific economics, economies at different levels and the blocks that have been formed. And I'm sure we can hear from Professor Ko and others the fantastic experiences that came out of it. Singapore, for example, signed its free trade agreement with the US through engagement with, um, with uh, 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 through its engagement at the uh, APEC. Finally, is an expansion in the GCC enough? And what does it mean? Is the APEC model enough for TIPI? Is it a combination of both? Is it important for us to view law and the rule of law from procedure and the manifestation of procedure before the substance, i.e. we shouldn't look at the final state before understanding how we can get there? 
the idea of depoliticizing the whole business of the Arab League, which is now again a gesture of good faith instead of having a Gulf representative give it to Egypt, which can't ma govern itself today just uh, out of good faith and failing policies for the last 60 years. Again, the goal is structure and sequentialism. The fundamental predictions, and this is my last slide, I promise, say it. Actually, it's not, but actually I'll move to the last slide. Um, Um, I would like you to think about um, the, 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 the regional political map for a moment and some of the bigger <coughs> problems that we're facing in the region, including Palestine. A new border of the GCC with Israel um, is going to be an interesting question for all of us. And whether or not we consider that there has been a value, and you know, in blogs today, we, we heard that the reason why there, Morocco was included is to make legal permissions for marriages for, for Saudis now in Morocco, which is, that's a joke, by the way. Having said that, we also need to think of ourselves, is it not time to reconsider whether we in the Arab hemisphere are not the Middle East and actually maybe West Asia? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's um, jump right into the discussion. Yes, please uh, identify yourself. Hi, um, I'm an NUS undergraduate and an intern at MEI. Mm. I would just like to ask. Do, do you have a name? Oh, sorry, my name is Chung Kui. Thank you. I'd like to ask the panelists to comment on how Al Jazeera affects power relations within the GCC, especially between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Thanks. Um, who would like to? Yeah. Um, what you mean is what is what is the tension or what's taking place right now? Yes. No. Not. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Cook also mentioned in his talk that. Qatar is trying to step out of the shadow of Saudi Arabia, so something along those lines. Well, I mean, what I'll say very quickly on that is that, you know, the tension has been split, for, uh, has been uh, calmed for a while now, and, the, and, and Qatar has signed this comprehensive security and political security agreement with Saudi. Uh, they were asked to not report on Bahrain, and they did that, and they were asked to pull their candidate to the Arab League, and they did that. I think Qatar has its own aspirations, which is understandable, but I'm not sure that there is a direct conflict right now, mm -hmm. even though we'll see a lot of uh, Qatar, um, as well as I would urge you to keep on following Qatar, Saudi, and Morocco in the coming months. Um, well, yes, certainly. I mean, Al Jazeera was one of the big factors uh, in the uh, difficult relations between Qatar and Saudi Arabia and it wasn't really the relationship wasn't really resolved uh, until the meeting took place in Saudi Arabia with the Qatari Emir who brought with him to that meeting uh, the chief editor of Jazeera uh, and uh, it has since been sort of an unspoken agreement that Algeria will, uh, Al Jazeera will also uh, you know, limit its uh, sort of negative coverage of, of, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that's been a key factor in, in the relationship to try to, to rein in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's what the Qataris are doing. Uh, uh, it's still a tool for them to uh, show a little bit of independence, and they certainly are using Al Jazeera for that effect. Uh, but in terms of the relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, the role of Al Jazeera is critical. If I can add uh, to that, <clears throat> the um, roots of it uh, have to do uh, more with the accession to power in July of 1995 of the incumbent emir in Qatar, especially in the aftermath of that with Saudi Arabia's Bahrain's and Abu Dhabi's support for the ousted emir. Uh, so you can see how the incumbent emir would have reacted negatively to all three of those and not totally passively, uh, but to show a proactive um, stance of some independence uh, there. Secondly, uh, 
rather than just uh, object to it, um, what the three did, uh, it began to host on Al Jazeera uh, dissidents or individuals from Saudi Baby who criticized the government and the ruling family. Now that's become fairly standard uh, fare because Jordan and Tunisia and Oman and the UAE and Kuwait and Bahrain have all re reacted to the same thing. But at the time when uh, Qatar did that, it, it, it was a first. It, it broke an unspoken code of civility, uh, of going after people personally by name. Yes, floor is open. Please. Uh, David Medjikov, uh, I guess, too political a friend of uh, Malik Dothman. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, what the possible expansion of the GCC means for the Arab League, I mean, or more generally, and, and maybe, maybe I missed the beginning. Um, does, uh, d do any of you see, see the possibility that the GCC could um, be stronger and also the Arab League? more of a useful role, or would you sort of uh, at odds if the GCC sort of expands a bit more significant than the other Lack of relevance becomes even more clear. Um, yeah, I'll have a whack at that. When the GCC was founded, there was some considerable bitterness by the ex members of the League of Arab States, although all GCC countries themselves were members of the League of Arab States. The bitterness was rooted in several phenomena. One is that these six countries that had been the last and the least to develop, had been the most forlorn and forgotten corners of Arabia, had passed the others on the inside rail uh, in terms of where they had been ridiculed and dismissed and derided for decades. Here they were at the tip of the spear showing that a six-state sub-regional organization could indeed come into existence and do some interesting things that others had not done. Uh, in order to uh, mitigate some of the hostility, the jealousy, and the envy uh, of the uh, non-GCC uh, countries, they purposely had their budget each year for the first decade less than the budget of the League of Arab States so as to, to uh, enforce or italicize they were not trying to replace it or even surmount it. We're part of the League of Arab States. Secondly, when they were accused of being a rich person's club or just a, a gang of sheikhs there, or a bungling band of brothers or a sordid sack of sisters there who uh, <coughs> were uh, cutting away from uh, the Arab body politic, Prince Saud and others uh, would counter this by saying, no, uh, we remain anchored uh, to uh, Arab brethren and, and sisters. Uh, from the beginning, we're co-founders of the League of Arab States. And if you look at the League of Arab States Charter, along with the Charter of the United Nations um, uh, Charter, both organizations encourage further regional integration, cooperation, uh, and developments uh, on the premise, strategically and conceptually, that such uh, achievements will strengthen uh, the whole, uh, as well as the individual uh, parts there. So I don't see it as a rivalry or competitive or divisive. Uh, I see complementarity and a, and a division of labor uh, between the two. No one is perhaps more uh, frequent a visitor to the GCC countries uh, in the Arab world than Amar Musa. And no uh, countries have been more proactive inside the League of Arab States than the GCC countries. Uh, so there's a symbiotic scratching of the back, a division of labor, and a complementarity of interest in, in um, successes. Um, okay, well, I would just want to go a little bit further. I just don't see this as going to come about. I don't see the GCC expanding to include Jordan and Morocco. I think it's a complete non-starter. I think it was an ad hoc sort of decision that doesn't have the support of all the other member states of the GCC. And we've already heard reservations from the uh, Qataris and the Kuwaitis on this. And I think it, it, it makes absolutely no sense. I, I don't see it, at least. Uh, I don't see where it would make sense. Uh, I don't, again, I don't see the GCC itself as a completely functional organization. And why would they then expand their membership and inherit two of the most perennial problems in the Middle East? And that's mm. the Western Sahara conflict and the Arab-Israeli issue. Uh, I don't see how it makes sense from an economic point of view. 
uh, you know, this idea that you bring in more, uh, you replace some of the labor in, 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 in the Gulf states then through import of, from, from Jordan, uh, or that you strengthen some of the defense ties because you uh, can fall back a little bit on, on the more professional J Jordanian army. Uh, but again, I don't see that where that is really the, uh, brings in any value added uh, as such. Um, so for me, uh, it's, it's even completely premature. I, there's no ex uh, really accession categories whereby the GCC can actually, how does it expand? What are, what are the modalities to where it goes about? Uh, and then what does this whole mean also for countries like Yemen and Iraq? Uh, who are, in a sense, Gulf states, and, and, and Yemen has been asking for membership for a long time, and, and, and the GCC has also uh, always held back. So I, I just, I see this as a complete nonsense. Um, I, I, I want to add just a bit of, uh, as well as the history there, I think that part of it is, was King Faisal's uh, um, uh, uh, sort of view of the UAE when, when the UAE um, uh, became united, um, as well as the sort of confrontation with Iran, and that was an important factor to contribute to the GCC. I do, I do disagree on, on one point in terms of the modalities. I do think that there are modalities. Again, the idea of open regionalism, it's precisely the idea that you're not confined by a region. In fact, some, one, of, one of the pundits was telling me that there is, a, there, there is, there is talk about calling it the Arabian Peninsula, uh, organization now as opposed to uh, GCC. But having said that, uh, Saudi Arabia is determined to move forward. Um, what's interesting is that the Jordanians came back and sort of said, you know, the Jordanians thought it was just about defense and common defense. Uh, but, you know, we all know the problems that were occurring between Abu Dhabi and, uh, and Saudi Arabia in terms of the emergency response uh, 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 apparatus for their uh, nuclear uh, 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 plants, which were planned on the <coughs> Saudi borders. Uh, they can't agree on the on, on they, 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 their, the the rift developed because of the location of the Gulf Central Bank and so on and so forth. But having said that, there is an emergency mode right now. And there is this idea of preservation of regimes and making sure that these regimes, no precedent will be allowed to see a monarchy fall. Um, and I think we really need to be real, we need to know that that's the dynamic that's taking yep. place. I think Morocco's submitted officially, they said that they're not sure that they are ready to join the GCC, they rather focus on the Maghreb Union. Um, but, um, you know, it, it could happen. I mean, the boss said so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I cannot resist but ask Martin a question since the president's here, and he's a water specialist. <laughs> and I think in studying economic development in GCC, what is the role of water management, which is very important? Uh, can we have a view from you? Uh, actually, a big question, but at the moment, um, I mean, water is just a scarce resource which can be, for this region, be uh, mitigated uh, by money. You know, desalinization, and uh, I think it's the way they, they see it all over. Uh, that, you know, if we have the money, if we have the gas or the oil to, to operate them, and probably and hopefully better technologies in the future, uh, water's not a problem. I mean, water is only a problem for agriculture. Uh, the price uh, of desalinated water is, is not a problem uh, when you consider drinking water or other types of water, but uh, for agriculture it is. But I think, you know, everywhere I've been asking people about planning issues and so on, water is not one of them because it's a matter, it's something that can be solved by money. Energy, right? Yeah. <coughs> it becomes an energy. Energy or money, yeah. I'll make a comment. Yes, um, I'll make a comment on that. Um, Kuwait and the UAE in particular uh, have those concerns, but two additional ones in terms of uh, the Iraqi nuclear plant, Iranian nuclear plant at Bushir being adjacent uh, to the, the Gulf. 
uh, with yeah. the history of Iran's earthquakes, um, the scenario of some catastrophe affecting the Bushir plant conjures up a scenario that no one would enter the Gulf uh, because of the hysteria, the fears uh, run amok. And therefore, the waters of the Gulf, which are fed into the desalination systems upon which all six GCC countries are vital for survival, uh, is a nightmare uh, scenario in the extreme. Uh, so that's wrapped up with the sanctions, it's wrapped up with the Soviets who were the ones who finished the plant, being also the inspectors of the plant, sort of putting in the fox with, with the chickens there. In the case of the UAE, um, it has to do with Iran's uh, annual military maneuver since 1993 in which they've shown a capacity to remain longer at sea without having to be resupplied with advancing their special operations and underwater commando facilities, which would provide them access to the UAE's water desalination, electric power generating plants, as well as undersea valves, offshore oil operating uh, platforms. So there's a different aspect of the water, not just the domestic aspect, but the external aspect there, where something to happen catastrophic in Iran or elsewhere, where ships uh, would not come into the Hormuz Straits, or they'd only come in at a pro prohibitively high expense in terms of the insurance that Lords of London mm -hmm. would demand they pay. Yes. Well, my question is for Christian. Uh, I think all economic cooperation has political implication. So my question is about China and GCC uh, free trade uh, area uh, uh, establishments. Uh, now you know China is negotiating with GCC countries for its establishment of free trade area. So what is the possible political implication for this kind of mm. FTA? Thank you. Um, well, I think there's been a, there's been a rush uh, uh, from the GCC sty, uh, side, uh, uh, not necessarily lately, but about three, four years ago, uh, about uh, finishing off a number of free trade area agreements, uh, which, however, in the end, only Singapore was the one that was actually concluded. Uh, there were negotiations not only with China, but with India, uh, with Australia, uh, a number of other countries. Uh, none of those have proceeded, uh, really. I think in the Indian case, uh, actually not even a meeting has taken place in, in, in the last three years uh, on proceeding with uh, uh, an FTA. Uh, now, there's, there was this uh, you know, initial rush to try to formalize the kind of relationship because, I mean, okay, yes, from an economic standpoint, Asia is extremely important uh, uh, to the Gulf. Uh, and they want to formalize some of those relationships in the economic realm. Uh, but I think there's a clear distinction being made within their uh, GCC states about uh, the economic imperatives uh, uh, and the, uh, the more broader role that uh, specific Asian countries might be able to play on the political strategic level. Uh, yes, I think there are views that say China can play an important political role as well because it is a member of the P5. Uh, it has uh, important ties to uh, uh, parts of the region which are of strategic importance also for the Gulf, and here specifically the China-Iran uh, uh, aspect to it. Uh, and therefore that by, by establishing at least uh, a political relationship at le with China, therefore you can uh, press more the Arab Gulf interests and, mm -hmm. and hopefully also convince uh, uh, China to to drop, drop some of its close relationships with Iran because of the concern that the uh, Arab Gulf states have uh, uh, about Iran and specifically. Uh, but and I just don't see the FTA at the moment uh, moving forward. I think there's been a little bit of a reevaluation from the GCC side about the need for the, many of these formalized uh, FTAs. We, we see this in the case of the, uh, with the EU. The negotiations have you know, basically have uh, been over more, for more than 20 years, and still there is no uh, actual FTA uh, in existence. And even here again, um, there is no negotiations have taken place now since the end of 2008. Mm -hmm. So concluding FTAs at the moment. Uh, 
uh, at the regional level on the GCC side. I don't see it as, as necessarily their priority uh, at the moment. Yeah, I, just very quickly, I totally agree on, on that assessment. I think that keep in mind that in the end of the day, the most important good that is being sold is, is oil, and that's not covered in most of these trade agreements. But it's the, on the, at the second level, it's petrochemicals. A country like Saudi Arabia, I think it was last year, officially, um, uh, China became officially the largest importer of oil uh, from Saudi Arabia, which shifted the dynamics even politically from, from U.S.-Saudi relations. Um, the other point that you have to keep in mind is that everything is being done bilaterally today, including the infrastructure that is being built, for example, for this, this huge Saudi Aramco Dow chemical project, which is a $70 billion uh, uh, project for petrochemicals, and the main market is, is, is China. Um, so everything is done more bilaterally. I think the GCC is really not being seen as an economic or trade vehicle. And even I think there was, there was supposed to be this week an ASEAN plus one or an ASEAN GCC meeting, which was just pushed over. I, I could be wrong, but I, I heard that, you know, they were just not interested or focused on that at this stage. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I agree with what Christian uh, said, but would add these two points that um, with regard to China, it doesn't have the baggage that either the EU or the United States uh, would bring to such a table to negotiate a free trade agreement w uh, with all six uh, GCC countries. In other words, the atmosphere is much more receptive and the moment would be much more politically propitious uh, to engage uh, extensively to explore the, uh, the possibilities of forging such an agreement or something just short of it that would be mutually uh, beneficial and reciprocally rewarded. And Christian's right that the one with the EU is dead, and yet that one had 21 years of investment of negotiation from 1987 when it began with the ministries of industry, economy, and finance of the GCC countries and the European countries, and it never came to um, fruition. A reason was the one that I outlined in terms of non-interference in the domestic affairs of one another. And so the EU's insistence on intruding or re-engineering or uh, affecting the GCC countries' positions and policies and actions and attitudes on human rights crossed a, bread, a red line because the GCC and uh, its members said, we, we're not asking you to change anything inside of your country. China is favorable in that regard. It is not interfering in the domestic affairs of any of the uh, GCC countries. With regard to the United States, there have never been any negotiations for this, uh, uh, not even right. one year. At most, there were bilateral uh, discussions between the private sectors of the GCC countries and the United States. But all of those ended in 2001 in September. There have not even been anything like that since. And if you want any, any indication as to where they would likely go if they were revived, one need only recall four years ago when Dubai ports were sought to invest in the United States Maritime Port Administration, where jingoism, racism, anti-Arabism, anti-Islamic uh, forces kicked in and killed it. Uh, and uh, there's no indication that that's likely to be reversed if you were to revisit it now, with some exceptions on the defense side. Let me just add, and I think that's absolutely correct. I think that's an important point in terms of seeing the trajectory a little bit of relations with Asian states, is that when you conclude deals with countries in Asia, you're not going to have the political baggage that comes along when you conclude deals either with the EU or the United States. And we see this specifically, I think, one of the reasons that the UAE has decided also to conclude its deal on nuclear technology with the South Koreans mm -hmm. and not with the French or with the United States, as everybody thought it was going to go. Because, I mean, this is, uh, A, it's an ex absolutely critical deal for the UAE. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, it's a lot of capital investment, and you're not going to put that much money into a deal that maybe, because political conditions change, uh, 
uh, in, in, in the supplier nation five or ten years down the road uh, uh, might mean that the deal never comes to fruition. Uh, with South Korea, you are having a much safer bet because you don't have that political component. You're still getting basically Western top-notch technology uh, and it's coming at a cheaper price, so uh, it makes absolute sense. Okay, um, I've received a signal that we are due to stop soon. I don't know why, because I thought we are supposed to stop at 4 o'clock. <laughs> okay, okay. So maybe we'll, we'll have two more um, questions. Is there any... Uh, All right, we don't have any more questions. I do have a, a couple, so maybe I will... Yes, there's one behind there, yes. Young, Young Mr. Young Rosali. Sorry if I just threw a question. I was not here earlier, so I missed some major parts of this discussion. Sorry, uh, this is uh, Mr. Young Rosali from Rajaratnam School of International yes, Studies. International Studies. Um, I just heard that uh, uh, the GCC is described as something not really uh, working as it should be. If I'm right in that, uh, what I heard, can I just ask for the opinion of the panel? Uh, to what extent uh, can this uh, uh, vision, as expect expressed by some, of a revival of the Silk Road? of ancient times between the East and uh, the Arab world through the GCT. It is something that can be realized, uh, and, and especially now, given the realities on the ground. Is that something really achievable? Hmm. I think I stopped there. Yeah, can I just uh, um, ask the same question in a, in a different way? Um, Dr. Dahlan was uh, talking about examples of experiments um, that, uh, proven experiments um, that show regionalism works. Um, and uh, Dr. Koch was, um, uh, you know, uh, talking about the, um, you know, the difficulties and, 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 and giving ra rather, you know, a negative, uh, I, I mean, uh, a bleak uh, um, outlook for the possibility of regionalism working. So my question is this. Um, is this a problem of the lack of a good model, um, you know, a viable model, uh, or is it more a problem you know, of um, individuals involved, the lack of political will, um, internal interests, even private interests uh, of rulers uh, overriding uh, you know, regional interests? So maybe... Um, first and then okay um, well I mean I think you know yes uh, it depends on how you phrase the question at the end of the day I think the uh, uh, the GCC uh, if you're looking at it is is there a functional uh, coherent GCC uh, foreign policy then I would say no the GCC doesn't function as it's supposed to be uh, but that was uh, never its intention in, in that sense I mean we have to look at GCC the C at the end stands for corporation it doesn't stand for union, like in the European Union. Uh, and the fact is that since its establishment, uh, uh, the GCC has sort of been operating on this principle of lowest common denominator, uh, whereby you find, you try to find some common positions uh, uh, regionally, but there's never been a serious attempt to look at, well, how do you actually develop the GCC and what it, is it? Uh, is just simply cooperation going to be sufficient enough, or do you want to carry it forward to, to, to a different level? Uh, and now, as we're entering sort of the, the next decade after three, and this is the 30th anniversary of the GCC, uh, I think it would actually be quite useful uh, to go back and, and, and have uh, leadership think a little bit of what do they want the organization for. Do they simply want it uh, as it has been, sort of as a, uh, an elite club, if you want? Because, again, here, one of the problems is that all the decision making is driven by a few uh, by the members of the ruling families in each of the countries. It's not. It doesn't have broad-based uh, uh, input by overall society into the kind of thinking about what do you want of the GCC. 
uh, uh, do, but is that low, lowest co uh, denominator approach uh, is still sufficient? Uh, or does one actually have to think about uh, other uh, approaches? And how do you then make the GCC, in that sense, more functional along the lines of what you want from it? Well, I, I, I think that, um, sort of to answer it from bo both sides, I, I agree. I think, I think the problem is that everything, any regional attempts are very politicized they lose focus in terms of what is it they need to achieve. If it's economic, if it's cooperation, whatever it is. And this is the point about functionalism. Um, on the other hand, there is a legal undertone there, which has always been a problem in the GCC. And I think the problem comes from Saudi Arabia. Um, in, in a book that uh, Professor Frank Vogel, who is a professor of Islamic legal studies at Harvard, he talks about uh, the Saudi legal doctrine in, ex in, in interpreting Sharia law. And he describes that as, as the microcosm, which basically means that it doesn't rely on the common law as a system of precedents that you can rely on, or a macrocosm of having sort of a, a defined code that you can rely on. So what ends up happening, and again, this is anecdotal from a, uh, one of the ministers from the Gulf states, other than Saudi Arabia, who was saying that you know, one of the problems we faced in our meetings was that every time we want to com come up with a model law that we can all apply, uh, the, 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 the problem that is faced by Saudi Arabia was to say, well, let's have it as a guiding law. So I don't think it's really political, but it's the, the idea of the, uh, the obligatory uh, sort of uh, feature of that law. So if you have all of these loose laws, it becomes problematic. Now, on the other hand, what, the reason why I put forth the idea of APEC is that there is, there is this assumption that, okay, if four of us agree on a specific issue, we can create an agreement, we can agree on it, and apply it. The disadvantage for those people who are not getting involved in the exercise is that they lose out. They don't get to reflect their points. So it kind of is an incentive for them to contribute to the discussion as to how you form an agreement or a, uh, a legal agreement that would apply. And again, it's, it's, this, it's this whole zero-sum approach that we've followed, whether it's in the Arab League and the GCC. You see the rule-making exercises, unless you get the full consensus, unless you have a full law, the, the whole idea dies or the whole agreement dies. And that's why I go to the point on incrementalism. Maybe you don't need it right now. Maybe you're a landlocked country. So why do we stop the exercise or the process of working together on achieving that? On the Asia bit, I really think that the answer is yes. 70% of the concentration of wealth, according to the world, one of the recent World Bank reports, for the next five years is going to be in the Gulf. Um, the, the industrial power that's coming out of China, and I see it every day in the, in the region, uh, the rise of China, which was something that I thought maybe was rhetorical here in Singapore. I used to hear it more, but we feel it. You go to Saudi Arabia, you go to the Gulf, and you see the massive construction exercises, what's taking place. It's unbelievable. I'm translating our website into Mandarin. We've hired two Chinese lawyers uh, because we're starting to realize that things have changed and we need to look uh, eastwards. And again, I do believe that we will redefine ourselves very soon as West Asia. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, to answer the question that was posed from, from down there about uh, reinventing the, uh, the uh, Silk Road, um, at least that's what Kuwait think they can do. In order, now when we see um, China, India taking off economically, uh, there will be a lot of shipment of goods from there. And instead of going through the Suez Canal, ships can go to Kuwait. They're building a grand new harbor. Um, and then uh, loaded onto um, uh, trains uh, through Iran, you know, Iraq, through Turkey, then to Europe, which is a much faster way. So uh, if uh, the situation in the, in the region is stabilized, then yeah, there might be some room for renewing the uh, old Silk Road. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, the, 
um, the faster route is the by sea, the Indian Ocean route uh, <laughs> taken by the Hadramis. Uh, and that has proven itself, it's worked. So <laughs> maybe we should revive that. Or Singapore Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I, we have to uh, end now. Um, so we end on that note. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers for their presentations and your participation.